Nature of Society, Part 1, Session 4. At the second session, we introduced the triad of land, labor, the man-made world, and the conditions at the point of interaction. This was de depicted thus, as this diagram here. Man-made world, work on land, with the conditions at the point of interaction producing the man-made world. This man-made world is produced by man's work on earth and the type of world created is dependent on the conditions at the point of interaction between man and land. Our study of the, uni of the, of the nature of society is in large part about these conditions. Last week, we looked at how a society is formed. In this scenario, land was freely available and as immigrants arrived, they would each in turn occupy the best lands available until eventually all the lands were claimed and appropriated. When this takes place, all new immigrants will have no free land available and will have to seek shelter and employment on those sites that are in occupation and production respectively for pur purchase, rent or lease from the landlords of those sites that may be free for such purposes. When land is all appropriated, the production profile will look something like this. So when land is all appropriated, we have the full occupation of all the available, all the available lands, valuable lands. We have the wages, or the wages are determined, the marginal product the net product and these will be discussed as we move along. Before we begin this exercise, there are a number of explanations that should be provided. One, each block column in our profile represents the production profile of the equal skill and effort provided by one man, that for each site each equal skill and effort is expended, which produces the varying levels of production from the best sites to the worst sites. The production profile is for all types of human act activity, commercial, industrial, agricultural, residential, and recreational. The production profile is depictive of the type of human activity being carried out. Commercial activity yields higher value per capita than do industrial or agricultural. Residential and recreational activity yield, yield the lowest values. We begin by determining how the general wage level is determined. When all lands are appropriated, that is where there are no lands freely available for production, then new immigrants or others have to seek employment or carry out production on those lands that are already claimed. Persons seeking employment will only be remunerated on the basis of what is received on the most marginal site in production. The most marginal site then determines the general wage level in the society for the particular trade. The level of production on this marginal site has primary claims of profit and wages. From profit, there would be the secondary claims of taxes, interest payments, dividends, and profit retained in the enterprise. The conditions at the point of interaction at this marginal site determine the wage level here, and by extension, the general wage level in the society. A higher level of taxation and or bank interest rate will affect the wage level in a negative way and determine whether the business is viable at all here. The conditions at the point of interaction is where social and economic policy has the greatest impact. An understanding of what the consequences will be at the marginal site when these policies are implemented is very important if the best man-made world is to be created in society.
Having understood the impact that taxation, interest payments, and other obligations have on the marginal site, we need to explore what should be the best policy to ensure that the marginal site is kept in production, for it is at the margin that the economy shrinks, that is, employment decreases, that wages and the standard of living are reduced, or the economy expands, employment and wages increase, and the standard of living rises. More will be said about the marginal site in the future. Here is an excerpt from Emil Wolf and John D. Allen's Towards a New Economic Technology. Studies to date have already shown predictably that added value per head is greater in industry than agriculture and greater in commerce than in industry. Beyond the margin, the point at which taxable capacity tends to zero, undertakings can be kept in production only by subsidy or by some artificial re relief from taxation, the condition that is so widespread in agriculture in Europe. This concept of the margin of production marks the starting point in determining taxable capacity. A marginal activity is one which, by the nature of its location and its activity, produces only sufficient to pay the wages of those involved. There is little or no margin to allow for asset replacement and certainly none for profits, taxation or reserves. Put it simply, putting it simply, the full value added will be allocated to employees. Businesses of this kind are vulnerable in the extreme. Businesses of this kind are vulnerable in the extreme. Any adverse shift in the terms of trade, overdraft limits, interest rates, etc., immediately threaten their existence. While in times of general economic boom, their numbers multiply rapidly. If prosperity is sustained, profit margins begin to appear and new entrants take their place at the margin. Since the only incomes produced at the margin are wages and salaries, any encroachment by taxation upon the maximum re remuneration acceptable will be met with demands to reinstate the standard of living in question. This produces the spectacle of successive chancellors having recognized these consequences of taxation, increasing personal allowances, family allowances, child allowances, etc., in order to minimize the imposition on those with small earnings. Mitigation is not enough. The clear conclusion is that all taxation on wages and salaries should be progressively reduced over a, per over a period and under no circumstances increased. As this happens, the tax burden on the enterprise experienced as costs of employment will, re will reduce in like moment and the inflationary pressures arising from pay demands would to that extent abate. So that's the statement. So during the week, have a look at why business enterprises fail and seek to determine the true reasons for failure. Have a look at taxation on wages and the impact that interest rate rise would have. Come back next week with your observations. And of course, these observations could be made in our Facebook live streams. Let us have a pause now. And again, I invite you to have a look at my four books available at Amazon.com. Very good reads on the subject. Uh, yes. Everything to gain by reading these books and nothing to lose. We will conclude the anecdote of the unbounded savannah by Henry George that we started 
in last week's session. Population still continues to increase, and as it increases, so do the economies which its increase permits and which in effect adds to the productiveness of the land. Our first settler's land being at the center of population, the store, the blacksmith forge, the blacksmith's forge, wheelwright shop are set up on it and on its margin, where soon arises a village which rapidly grows into a town, the center of exchanges for the people of the whole district, with no greater agricultural productiveness than it had at first. This land now becomes begins to develop a productiveness of a higher kind. The, to labor expended in raising corn or wheat or potatoes, it will yield no more than those things that, than the first. But to labor expended in the subdivided branches of production that require proximity to other producers, and especially to labor expended in the final part of production, which consists in distribution, it will yield much larger returns. The wheat grower may go further on and find land on which his labor will produce as much wheat and nearly as much wealth. But the artisan, the manufacturer, the storekeeper, the professional man, find that their labor expended here at the center of exchanges will yield them much more than if expended even at a little distance away from it. And this excess of productiveness for such purposes, the landowner can claim just as he could an excess in its wheat producing power. And so our settler is able to sell in building lots a few of his acres for prices which it would not bring for wheat growing if its fertility had been multiplied many times. With the proceeds, he builds himself a fine house and furnishes it handsomely. That is to say, to reduce the transaction to its lowest terms, the people who wish to use the land build and furnish the house for him, on condition that he will let them avail themselves of the superior productiveness which the increase of population has given to the land. Population still keep on increasing, giving greater and greater utility to the land, and more and more wealth to its owner. The town has grown into a city, a St. Louis, a Chicago, or a San Francisco, and still it grows. Production is here carried out on a grand scale, with the best machinery and the most favorable facilities. The division of labor becomes extremely minute, wonderfully multiplying efficiency. Exchanges are of such volume and rapidity that they are made with the minimum of friction and loss. Here is the heart, the brain, of the vast social organism that grown up from the germ of the first settlement. Here has developed one of the great ganglions of, human, of the human world. Hither run all roads, hither set all currents through all the vast regions round about. Here, if you have anything to sell, is the market. Here, if you have anything to buy, is the largest and choicest stock. Here, intellectual activity is gathered into focus. And here springs that stimulus, which is born of the collision of, the mind, of mind with mind. Here are the great libraries, the storehouses, and granaries of knowledge, the learned professors, the famous specialists. Here are the museums and the art galleries and all things rare and valuable, the best of their kind. Here come great actors, the orators and singers from all over the world. Here, in short, is a center of human life in all its various, in var its varied manifestations. So enormous are the advantages which this land now offers for the application of labor that instead of one man with his span of horses Scratching over acres, you may count in places thousands of workers to the acre, working tier on tier, on floors raised one above the other, five, six, seven, eight stories, 
from the ground, while underneath the surface of the earth, engines are throbbing with pulsations that exert the thoughts of hundreds of horses. All those advantages adhere to the land. It is on this land and no other that they can be utilized. For here is the center of population, the focus of exchanges, the marketplace and workshop of the highest forms of industry. The productive powers that density of population has attached to this land are equivalent to the multiplication of its original fertility by the hundredfold and thousandfold. And rent, which measures the difference between the ad this added productiveness and that of the least productive land in use, has increased accordingly. Our settler, or whoever has re succeeded to his right of the land, is now a millionaire. Like another Rip Van Winkle, he may have laid down and slept. Still he is rich, not from anything he has done, but from the increase in population. There are lots from which, for every foot of frontage, the owner may draw more than an average mechanic can earn. There are lots that will sell for more than would suffice to pave them with gold. In the principal streets are towering buildings of granite, marble, iron and plate glass, finished in the most expensive style, replete with every convenience, yet they are not worth as much as the land upon which they rest. The same land, in nothing changed, which, which when our first settler came upon it, had no value at all. That this is the way in which the increase of population powerfully acts in increasing rent, whoever in a progressive country will look around him may see for himself. The process is going on under his eyes. The increase the increasing difference in the productiveness of the land in use, which causes an increasing rise in rent, results not so much from the, the necessities of increased population, compelling the resort to inferior land as from the increased productiveness which increased population gives to the lands already in use. The most valuable lands on the globe, the lands that yield the highest rents, are not lands of surpassing natural fertility, but lands to which a surpassing utility has been given by the increase of population. Next week, we will have a look at the effect that any current regime in taxation has on production in the economy and what might be the best tax policy that would, lead, that would have the least impact on production and employment. Before we end, I would like to let you know, to let you attendees know, that Unsustainable Development is an educational offering devoted to the dissemination of its course to all of mankind and to those who have the English language as their official language in the first instance, and to all eventually all over the world. To make this possible, and because we do not charge a fee for this dissemination, we rely wholeheartedly on monetary donations to meet the cost of achieving these goals. If you have found these sessions useful thus far and would like others to have access to them, we would gratefully accept your donations should you be inclined to offer them. You can send donations to our PayPal account at your email address nigelwittens at gmail.com. Thank you for your kind gesture.